how I've really come about. I'm very lucky to become involved with some really good athletes. And that's, I don't know, that's probably by luck, management or whatever. But I've had a succession of really good athletes and they've taught me a lot. And um, because you're associated with good athletes, um, you get into positions where you can have some more influence maybe. Uh, certainly hasn't been a smooth process. Um, I've been dumped by some very good athletes. Um, but luckily I've been involved, I got involved with the superstar and um, and I'd just like to very quickly run through what happens sometimes, the coaching pathway. Um, and I'll read off my little notes here. Um, you get involved with the superstar. Everyone thinks you're fantastic um, around the athletics world. I think it must be because of you, not the, not the fact that the athlete's got massive talent. Um, then the athlete either retires or or they move on or they, or they dump you or something, or they fail. Sometimes they fail eventually. Um, but then the people, they're interested in the failures. So they look at the failures and think, oh, the failures are due to the coach, so he's no good. Um, so all of a sudden you become, you were great one minute and then you're no good the next. Um, then a period of time elapses, and that period of time is really important. You get that little break where you don't really are involved with any really good athletes and you, you drift away. And, but eventually, after a few years, your failures are then forgotten people have forgotten your actual failures, but they're still, they still think of Kathy Freeman. So they think, oh, don't, they don't think about the five or six athletes that maybe haven't worked out that well. Um, so then successes are remembered and you become an elder statesman. And that's now what I am, and I suspect Sharon's about to be one and uh, uh, a lot of other people. You become an elder statesman, your only, your only successes are, are remembered but your failures are forgotten. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you're an elder statesman and you just drift along and no one really, you don't coach anyone and no one cares. Or sometimes you, you, you hang in and you're, I don't know, just, just stubborn and you keep going and you get another, you might get another good athlete. And then you, then you might, the process might continue. So I, I don't know, I've now got quite a, a couple of quite good athletes again, um, but I'm not sure well, I've got enough time to go through the process of getting to be another elder statesman when I'm about 95. Um, there are a few coaches around that are in their 90s. Um, but we've had some great sessions and um, so I'm just more, this is more of a practical, I think, session rather than we've had a lot of brilliant theory from a lot of brilliant theorists and, um, and practice, practice people. But I just want to talk about a couple of things that I've, that I've been involved with. This, it's probably not in the order, it's not really what Blair had on the, the listing. Um, I just want to talk about the, um, coaching athletes that are probably moving up from 400 to 800. And you, many of you will have, um, will have maybe had athletes in that situation. Um, and we'll move on to the next one. Just talking about the 800 running. Um, you've got to have good speed to run a good eight. Um, so there's some scope for saying people who have been running forwards are possibly good candidates. Um, if you're running 145 and you're running, or, or in a girl, you're running 158, you really need pretty good speed. Um, now there's, a, there's a, a sort of a rule, I don't really know who came up with it, about the four second rule, and that's if you go through your first four in an eight faster than your, uh, four, faster than four seconds slower than your best four, you'll die. Now, it does vary, but certainly probably is the case with a 400 runner building up. Um, so you really need to run those sort of times, 158 and 145, you really need to be better than probably 47 for a male and 54 for a girl. 54 is probably pushing it, although we have had, um, we'll go a little bit further down, we'll talk about some of those runners down there. Um, so, so you've got to develop a bit of a system that they can cope with two laps. and. Um, there's a physical element and a mental element. Most 400 runners or sprinters don't like going around twice. They don't like going past the finish line. So um, you've, got to, you've got to change their mentality so they're not so scared about going around twice. Um, and that takes a bit of training and a bit of time. Um, and hopefully they've got the durability, they've got the technique, and there's a, there is a technical aspect to it. Um, you've got to, be, you've got to have, have a good rhythm and good and good technique to, to really do it efficiently because efficiency is a huge thing. Um, just got here, history suggests that especially with female athletes, there is evidence that the suitable 400 athlete might make a, a successful transition. 
Um, there's probably more cases in Australia of girls going from four to eight than there is for, for men, maybe. Um, and I, I, I draw the 800 into three types. There's the 4-8 type, the, the 815 type, and the 8 type. Um, now, of those, all those, they're the, they're the runners that have broken two minutes. Um, five of arguably are 400 athletes that have, built, that have worked up. So, I mean, it's quite a good stat. It really does. People maybe wouldn't realise it, but that's five. Renzina, Lewis, Pollock, Pape, Andrews and, and Andrews of all were all 400 athletes initially. Um, Bissett, even at 12, was a 400 metre runner, but um, she's a slight separate case. I, I, I put her as an absolute 800 type. Um, Marg Crowley was a 1500 type who just was as strong as an ox, and so she ran even pace for two laps and ran sub two. Um, so you've got to make a careful selection. Um, so as I said before, not everyone can do it. Um, I, I did it recently with Annalise Ruby, um, and she was coming. She was going along very well, um, but she got caught up in the four by four stuff. So we had to really alter things because that was where, where she was getting international selection for at the time. So um, she's gone back to fours, but maybe in the future. Um, she's, and she's rehabilitating from a very nasty injury at the moment. Um, so you've got to start bringing the aerobic loads in, but it's probably done a bit differently than just being a distance runner. You don't want to turn them into a distance runner, in my view, um, because you'll lose, probably you lose the speed that you need, because um, their best feature is their speed, and you can't let it go. Like when Tamsin was, um, in 2000, she ran, uh, 159.21 and 51.41. <coughs> and that, that was done at the same time, basically. Um, currently, we've got Morgan Mitchell, who's the top 400 runner, who's moved up to eights. Um, now, she, at the moment, is probably, her speed is suffering a little bit, but I think that will come back. And so she's got a very good chance of being a, uh, a very, very significant 800 runner. Um, way we've done it, and, um, is, is really to increase the volume of the track sessions, get them used to running more volume on the track um, and bring in some um, threshold type work. Just a couple of mentions of Susan Andrews, uh, who I did coach, <laughs> um, she wrote a very good article in One Leaving Coach a few years ago where um, talked about 800 running and um, she quoted a couple of coaches um, talking about the need to maintain speed if you can. Um, both coaches acknowledged it was very difficult to expect such athletes to be totally maintain their PB level at four. Um, Tamsin did, um, but then it, it changed um, later on in her career. Um, and other coaches talk about needing to get your 1500 better. Um, Kat Bissett hasn't She's only run, well, she, she came second in the Vic Mile Championship, but it's not really that relevant, wasn't that fast or anything. Maybe just shows that weren't very many good athletes in it. Um, Tony Benson, he thought about you should train them to run a good 1K, and that's probably, that's probably pretty reasonable. Um, he liked, he, he worked a lot on the aerobic system. Um, my beliefs, um, you've got to work on the, you've got to, you got to work on their weaknesses, but maintain, but enhance if you will, and maintain their strength if you can. Um, I quoted that one there. Um, Kat Bissett, Kat, Katarina Bissett, who's just run, Katrina Bissett, who's just won 159.78, um, her PB for 456 seconds. But I think that's a correct PB. <laughs> Currently, I think she's a bit better than that. Her last rep the other night in a rep, she ran a 400 and did 55.3, so I suspect the 56 is, a, is a, in the past. Um, try to keep your repetition. This is just some of the ways we do it. Um, doing reps, greater than around race distance using floats, so you do split, split eights or split whatevers. Um, we, we might run longer than the, your race distance, but with a, a differ differentiation of pace. Um, 
repetitions under race distance at race pace. I don't like going much slower than race pace for this type of athlete. Um, I try to work the session around their, their current or targeted race pace as much as I can. Um, and we often will often go to say Princess Park in Melbourne and run three minutes, two minutes, one Ks um, with a short, with a half, probably a half recovery um, at slower speeds, but that's to work the, develop the aerobic system a bit more. Um, there's a couple of example sessions there. Um, <coughs> I'm a little bit of a fan of this splitting up first one of the bottom group, the second group, running a 500 or a 400 or something at, at a race pace, have a, a reasonable walk so to recover a fair bit, then do some, some under distance reps with really quite short recoveries, then have a three minute walk and then, then try and run a, a 400 at the end on race pace, uh, second lap race pace, um, just to try and simulate the effects of an 800 in training a little bit. Um, if anyone wants to ask anything along the way, just jump up. Um, <coughs> so those um, second group of sessions a bit like that, where you're running, um, trying to simulate the 800 a bit. Um, the one on the the one on the bottom of the top group, the 300 at race. I really like that session. You run a 300 in your race pace, but let's say you're trying to run two minutes, 45 seconds. Then you run a 200 or you flow to 200 in 45 seconds. And then you then run another 45 second 300. Um, so 200 at, at 45. So the three splits are the same speed, same time. And you know, we've got um, one, of, one of my girls has done 215, 800 doing that. Um, I think you'd probably go quicker than that if you want to, but, and I'd might do two of those in a session with a f long break between them. And there's some of the other sessions you might do to develop your, your help develop your aerobic system or your aerobic anaerobic crossover a bit more. Um, and a couple of test sessions down the bottom, which people have given me along the way. And people, have, I don't know how many people have done the Cosman test at all. Anyone done a Cosman test or had an, an athlete do a Cosman test? Uh, I'm not sure how accurate they are. They're supposed to simulate an eight time. Um, Got to be a bit careful because you don't necessarily want to be stuck on what a Cosman test tells you you can run an eight in because it might say, oh, I can't run a very good eight, so I'm not going to do them. Um, but, um, and it's got a ridiculously complex um, sort of formula on the bottom, which, you, which if you go on, onto um, the website of um, Brian Mack, you can, the computer will do it for you. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about all that. <laughs> um, and the four four hundreds, which is a bit of a a standard session of various people. Um, the, the endurance side of it, I like to do away from the track. I think we get enough track work. Um, so we tend to do it on, you know, things like, like the Tan or, or Princess Park or um, just lately I've been with a young athlete, I've been going to Central Park in Melbourne, if anyone knows Melbourne well. Um, it, was, it was famous at one point because John Landy once trained there. So um, I don't know how much training he did there, but he lived near there and he was doing a bit of work on Central Park. So we've been going a 600 metre gravel path, circular. Um, <coughs> so we, we, we still get them to do Monofartlek, which is a, a famous, famous Australian distance session, which I'm sure Di's done a few times. Um, Apparently it's not very scientific at all, and ra ra Chris Wardle once told us how it was worked out and had no science in it whatsoever. <laughs> I want to do a fart leg session, Mona. Oh, how about I do 290s, 260s, 430s and 415s seconds? Oh, that sounds all right. What's the, the basis of Mona fart leg? That was about, apparently how long it took to, to be come up with. Um, You've got to keep the 400 training going with them, um, uh, especially, well, once you've certainly got their, you can work on, you can periodise it a bit so you can work on their, their longer distance for a while. And um, I, like Sharon, probably come from the long to short, 
but I appreciate the short to long and I have a colleague in Sydney who's very much on short to long um, and we chat away um, but I haven't quite got to the point of doing short to long with my athletes yet. Um, short to long meaning that you train at shorter distances at high speed right through the whole program. Start it off with that and you build up the distance as you go through by and by. Very, very oversimplified version. Uh, whereas traditional long to shorts, the, the old Russian thing where you start long and you build it all down and by the time of the season and you're, and you're trying to run fast, you're then doing really quite fast work. Um, and there's various, there's various um, periodised plans that people do. I think the word periodisation has become a bit out of fashion, I, but I think everyone uses, uses it even if they don't call it that. Um, just a little thing on the, on the, the Hall and Peter Coe multi-tiered or multi-pace program, which I must have been, I, I see a lot of benefits in, and I, I've sort of done it a bit, but not properly. And that's to divide your program into, um, into your micro cycles, probably uh, in a lot of cases it might be a two week micro cycle to fit it all in. Um, I, still w I still work on a weekly micro cycle or a monthly meso cycle. Um, but you do, you do the session, each, each individual session is targeted for a particular uh, distance or pace. So one session might be a, a pure speed session, one session might be 400 lactate, uh, one session might be 800, so the 800 specific work, and then the other session might be at, a, at a, the distance above your distance, which in this case might be a 1500 session. Um, and I think it's got some sense to it because you are getting an all-round picture of the athlete, of the, of the requirements of the, of the athlete that the athlete needs to run the event they're targeting. Um, so they get a little bit more used to running longer with their 1500 work and you're trying to keep their speed levels up by doing some shorter stuff. Um, anyone got any, anyone ever tried the multi-pace stuff? Couple, couple, we've got a couple. What do you, what do you think? Hmm. I, I think it's got a lot going for it, but I, I still haven't quite. Last, uh, two years ago we did it, and it was pretty useful. <coughs> but I have to say last year we probably didn't, and it was probably for other factors. But um, uh, this current year we, we're probably more, um, well, with, with Miss Bessett, well, she's got a lot of events this year, so it's probably not as easy to do it with. Um, Training load's very important. I think um, we've all, has anyone ever coached, any, coached any number of athletes who've, who've never been injured? Has anyone ever had a non-injured total training squad in their life of coaching? <laughs> Pretty lucky if they have, or if they're not working very hard one or the other. Um, so, but load's hugely important and, and you, you really need, well, the athlete and the coach need to monitor it quite closely. Um, and there's various, there's some, been some very good stuff put out by the AAS about training loads, and you've just got to be very careful to, and it's mainly the, the sudden increases that you've got to watch. It's not so much the volume you do, it's, um, um, I mean, as Dave would know, there's a walk that have done some pretty significant volumes along the way, um, and haven't particularly got overuse injuries out of it, they might have got other injuries, but, um, but if you go from, let's say you're doing 50k a week and you suddenly go to 80, um, you're playing with fire. So you've got to really graduate it slowly because you'll get there eventually, but it's not much point getting there if you get there in, in four weeks and then you've got an eight week um, stress reaction or something. So um, very important to monitor the loads. Just a quick talk about Katrina Bissett who's, who's currently um, the number one 800 runner. We'll see, maybe we'll see on um, Thursday whether she still is the number one 800 because it's, it's a very good race at the Oceania Games and the women's eight. The, the, the best Australians are all in it and a couple of very good New Zealanders are in it. So it'll be a good race. Um, but she's an interesting athlete because she was, she came from Canberra pretty well initially, although it may be another place before that. But, and she was a very good 12 year old. She was, um, she ran 58 seconds or something at 12. Um, so she was pretty talented. Um, but she had a few issues. Um, 
which are well documented now that she's had a lot of anxiety issues, etc., and, and um, has really struggled with things. And she pretty well, while she kept a bit of running going, she, she gave away the ass to, to be more academic. And um, she's now 25 and she really got going in about 22. So she didn't really run from, if you like, from say 12 or 13 to 22. And there's not many athletes in that situation, I don't think. Um, so she hasn't gone through, well, she probably did go through little A's, <laughs> but she didn't go through junior A's really at all. Um, so she started, got, went to, to uni in Sydney doing architecture and, um, and started running and training again with Dean Gleeson up there and, um, and she managed to get a 211 in 2016. Um, then she moved to Melbourne and it's not, not moving to Melbourne that necessarily made her a better athlete, but she was starting to get ready to improve. Um, very strong, like she was very quick to see that she was underachieving based on her training. Um, doing a master's in architecture at Melbourne Uni, joined our group, which has got a, a good little group of 800 girls. Um, so in 2017, she ran 209 and ranked 47, 218, 203 and ranked 7, and 219, 159 ranked 1. So it's quite a meteoric rise in a lot of ways, 47 to 7 to 1, which you should all be gratified and if you're coaching athletes are ranked in the 50s, there's a chance. <laughs> they might just need that little bit and you'll, they'll become better. Um, so, um, and the, the, the effort she did in 2000 was made even a bit better because she did miss quite a bit of training uh, around December through a, a stress reaction that she got. She had a, a tibial stress reaction. Uh, luckily, very good rehab outcome. Um, almost hardly seemed to be um, affected, although it took her a little while with races. She started out running sort of 205 and then 203 and then around the Vic titles just sort of went bang. And um, some of that was confidence and some of it was a accumulation of pretty good quality training. She's a very strong girl. Um, and then she's suddenly got selected for everything sort of thing. So um, back to the diet thing, she's vegan. Um, it's interesting, two of the three podium people at the Women's Eight at the Nationals this year are, are vegans, which is not necessarily saying that 800 women should become vegans. <laughs> um, I think it probably adds a, a, a layer of complexity to the whole process, but uh, they, they tend to become pretty good at sort of sorting it through. But I think it's probably um, still very, I think, with, especially with women, I think it's very, you'd need to work a little, hopefully work a little bit with, your, with the nutritionists. Um, she, she monitors, she has regular blood tests and she has been low in ferritin a few times, but generally speaking, it's sorted out. Um, I know there's a lot of, we, we do monitor, that seems to be the main thing that the blood tests seem to look at is ferritin. Um, anyone coach athletes that are very low in ferritin or have been or die? There's a few hands. Mm. Yeah. What What did you do about that? Well, well done a time record on it. Yes, time. yes. Everyone knows. I, she was the one I coached from age 11 to 21. She suffered <coughs> uh, low iron. This, uh, I mean, it was genetically linked. Yeah. Um, a lot of people it is, yeah. Yeah, so um, what I did is... I was talking to this gentleman before. I did, I couldn't let her. I couldn't load her. I couldn't do. Yeah. On the, you know, so impact running because she was. Doing, so we did a lot of cross training, a lot of yep. in the in the gym, a lot in the pool, as well as the running. So she was when she was winning nationals as an under twenty, she was running a third of the volume that the others were. Mm. So yeah. So yeah. you just had to monitor her load and work around that. Well, it's you know, and and they they get a low iron, and depending on how low it is, they um. They get put onto iron tablets, and of course that's fine. But iron tablets take months to really have an effect. Yes, sir. Um, I went to see a dog with my outfit, and we just put on the drip under the allowance, and she get the iron through that. Yeah. Well, usually, okay, if, if it's very low, what you need to do is have an, usually have an iron injection or an infusion, and that works a lot quicker than um, iron tablets because you've got to look very long term with improving your, your iron with, with tablets, because it's, it's a slow yeah. process. Peter, what's, the, what's the biggest change that's happened with um, uh, Miss Bissett? You know, going from 
Well, I think she just started training a bit harder, by, by and large. And she was training in a group of girls that were between um, 202 and 208, basically. Um, and I think you just caught up with it and just started to show that she was a ready match in training for the 202 runners. She would, she would crunch sessions. I mean, she's, she did a session the other night. She had eight 300s the other night with Georgia Griffith with three minute, three minute recoveries. And they did eight threes and they're running 44, 45s. And the last two, Katrina just decided, oh, it's a bit slow. So she whacked out two 42s. And at the end of that session, and um, um, so confidence and everything. It's a whole. I mean, she still has the anxiety issues. I mean, some of the some of the stuff that I've read, you know, cries all night before a race, <laughs> uh, doesn't sleep and cries all night, but then runs 159. So whatever it is, she can she can comp compartmentalise the the, men the mental stuff and the physical stuff pretty well. But it's a bit rare, I think. But it's, it's good that she does. <laughs> but how do you manage the, the three international competitions this year? Well, it, it is. Look, I did agonise over that a bit. But I think I looked at it in two ways. First of all, I said, oh, it's, there's one too many there. Can't do it. But with Freeman, I was used to double periodisation all the time. So <coughs> she would run our season. All right, she could train through a bit. But then she'd run September. And that was her big season. Was so I thought. Well, and in her case, she's so inexperienced that I thought the benefits of getting some decent competitions would possibly outweigh. But I think it can be done. It's not. Um, well, we'll see. <laughs> at, at what point is, you mentioned that organic? She decided to just drop three seconds in the last two reps. There. Um, at, at what point do you jump in and, and influence? Like, oh, well, look, I hate to say it, but I didn't jump in. Well, I didn't have much time to jump in because there wasn't much between them and, and then the, the two were done and then the session was finished. But I was probably quite happy that she did it, actually, um, because she finished strongly and well. And um, I think one of the things I, I do get concerned about is if the last rep is so savage that, you, that you, you, your time drops by um, a lot, you know, a number, and then you, you, you're quite exhausted. And I, I think you've got to be a bit careful with that too much. But... Uh, in her case, it didn't, so um, I thought it was probably, uh, maybe no, no more. Maybe the ninth would have been, could have been disastrous, um, but I think up to that point it was all right. Um, but she hadn't done eight threes before. That was, that was a, a Georgia Griffith session. We, we swapped sessions. We did our, my session the week before and then her, her, her coach's session. A um, bit, bit of an example of coaches working together a little bit, which I think has been really, really good. Um, but that's basically a rough idea of a training program, say in, I don't know, January this year. I mean, it's not particularly, the, the element that's not there is the speed element, and that's, uh, I'll come to that in a second. Um, I mean, it's not, there's nothing particularly <laughs> revolutionary there by any means. Uh, no, not much innovation or uh, creativity really, but um, <laughs> a few words that have been used before. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, that's basically roughly similar to what she's been doing. Um, she got into the, we, we, the girls all got into the long run on Sunday, which is a bit of an old Melbourne thing, isn't it, Di? Um, and they, I mean, they quite enjoy doing it, so I haven't cut it out. I mean, it probably, as the world champs come up, it'll probably, I may not do it in, in um, August this year, <laughs> possibly. Um, does she do any recovery modalities as part of that? Is that program good? Does she sort that out herself? Uh, she pretty well sorts that herself. And, and she's, she's a member of the Melbourne Uni Club. And um, she gets a fair bit of support from Melbourne Uni. Um, and, uh, but it's probably an area that she could get better at. Um, because she, the other thing she does, which is, I'm not sure is a good idea, she, she rides, she, her... her form of getting around Melbourne is to ride her bike. And basically every, every training session she rides from, I don't know, the North you know, Brunswicky area in Melbourne to Olympic Park or Lakeside, which is, you know, it's probably a 30 or 40 minute bike ride. Now, I, 
I actually think it's probably helped her a fair bit in a lot of ways because it's she's it's helped the toughness I think if nothing else, um, and I think also the bike running may have had a bit of a bit, maybe a bit of an effect on her I don't know maybe her general strength levels in her legs, um, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's everyone, <laughs> but she does and that's the way she doesn't have a car doesn't she has a license but not a car and. It's cheap, it's money, and she's a student, so it's, it's a money thing. So that's the way she does it. Things are going forward with her, I'd like to work, now that we've got to a good point of, like she's, right at the moment, she's number, <coughs> number six in the world. Um, now that will change, obviously. But it's been going, the season's been going a little bit now, and still, she's still number six. She was number one in March. <laughs> But then, no, she's number two in March because some a Cuban girl had, had run, I don't know where, outdoors, had run 200, but I don't know where that was or how. Um, but I'd like to work on maybe working the, the 400 in. She wants to work the 400 in a bit more. Um, and when the athlete says they want to do it, you probably should very strongly consider it. <laughs> Otherwise, they might get angry. Um, she's a, an interesting runner. She runs with a, a lot of bounding power <laughs> i've mean, noticed it if she's anyone's noticed her running which i you know i don't mind but because it, it's it exudes strength and um and she can handle it so um but i wouldn't mind efficiency levels going up a bit more and we'll try and work with some biomechanic biomechanists on that uh carefully monitor the load levels again uh or still and we've got to redirect her from being a, if you like, an inter-club runner almost to now being an international athlete. And that's, you know, there's various ways of doing that. And she's well on the path. Um, she's, going to, she's doing world unions and she'll stay on and run some races and that will all help her situation. Just want to, I don't know how much longer I've got, Blair, where is he? <laughs> he's, oh, he's over there somewhere. Um, I'll push through because I haven't touched on Freeman. I don't know whether people really, people, but Freeman's probably a bit old hat now. I think we've done Freeman, but it will. Just one question. Yes. Um, being a Melbourne-based athlete, what preparation do you go for in terms of hip hop? Aha, that's a good point. Um, pr well, she'll be in Europe for a period of time, which will be some sort of help. Um, I'm not that, if, if she was a marathoner, I'd be probably far more concerned. I think running two minutes it's probably not the end of the world. I, it'll be an air-conditioned stadium but there's obviously around the around the stadium will be hot. Um, um, we haven't made a particular um, heat acclimatisation plan. She hasn't really got the wherewithal yet to be traipsing off everywhere to do things so that might come in more but I think to some extent we'll have to wing it a little bit Dove. Sounds a bit amateur I know but um, um, she's also studying and got various commitments there. So um, this year might be a little bit of a, uh, a fact-finding year. Um, and then hopefully if she does well, then we, the whole thing can be much more professionalised uh, and leads in nicely to this section here, which is called being professional. Um, now this is just a bit of general stuff for people becoming elite athletes. And I use the word professional because not because they're making money necessarily, because not that many do. Um, but, but it's about attitude. Attitude and determination to do everything that will lead to optimal performance. And all the speakers so far have covered various aspects of this, I think. Um, and I divide into preparation, ethical standards. And ethical standards is a highfalutin name for, I couldn't figure a better name. So I put ethical standards and performance excellence. Um, Preparation. Establish the optimal coaching and support there. This is vitally important to elite athletes. They must, you must, the athlete must develop their, t their team. We, all, we had Team Freeman, it'll come up a bit later. Um, and for that they need, the athlete should get their, the coach should provide them a decent training program. It's probably not good enough. When they become an international, it's not good enough to say, what do we do tonight, coach? And the coach says, oh, I think we'll do 8 300. Um, what are we doing tomorrow? I haven't got that far yet. Um, so I think you've got to start. And when you get old, you, you actually can't remember enough. So uh, I don't have to write everything down now. So they say, what are we doing? I say, oh, look, tomorrow you're doing that. And we do, can change things, by the way. <laughs> um, 
trying to seek optimal training schedule, and, and it alludes to what Dave was just saying about heat acclimatisation a bit, you try to seek the optimal situation that you need. Um, and one of the things you might need is, 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 a, is a heat room or something like that because you're going to some enormously hot place to race. Um, but you try and get a decent environment. So you want, you want access to a track reason. And it's amazing how difficult sometimes that can be. Um, sometimes in Melbourne it can be, even though there's probably 20 tracks in metropolitan Melbourne, and still sometimes you can't always find one. <laughs> um, uh, you want decent facilities, you want equipment. Um, you want you know, a place you can do your weights easily without stressing about where you're going to do your weights. And that's a, so you need, to set, you need to set the program up. Um, important to include recovery, diet, massage. I think massage is very, very important. Uh, I think Freeman's career was really, in a way, built on massage. Was that a hand up or was that just Christian stretching? Oh, I think it's stretching. <laughs> Christian stretching up there. <laughs> um, you need the right amount and the right type of training, and that's, you know, that's, who knows what that is, but as a coach, you, just, you have your own system and you do it, and if the athlete runs well, you're probably doing a fair job. Um, and it should progress. You need to have progression. Um, life balance. Um, I think Di's point about students, and the, it's much easier to be an ath a, a elite athlete. Well, there's two ways. You can either be so independently wealthy that you don't need to work at all, but the, best, the second best way is to be a student because they can use, they can work time and they can, often their uni has facilities they can utilise. It's, 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 no, it's no surprise that most of our decent athletes have, be, have been university students and partly that might be because they want to be a good athlete. <laughs> um, includes with your coaching team, ensuring your training program is established and maintained according to a number of factors. Such as you know, athletes like to, most, a lot of athletes like to now coach. What's my goal? I want to, I want to work on my goal. This is what I reckon my goal is. What do you think? Sort of thing. They like that. A lot of them. <coughs> um, the squad's important. The, the support you get from your squad very important. Um, what, the earlier thing where we had our fractured relationships thing. I was I was telling them a story about two of my athletes um, who were very 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 close. Two females, very close. Um, friend, very f good friends, and then they had a falling out. Now I know only can, and now coach one of them, <laughs> so that can be a real issue. So the squad's good, and, and they get a lot out of the socialisation of their squad and the fact. Who am I training with tonight? Just things like that. And they, athletes like to have someone to train with, and, and when you get a two-minute 800 girl, you start to look at men, and you need, you know, and then you've got to try and find you know, a male two-minute runner who's willing to sacrifice his, his running. And that's not always easy. There are some around who will do it. Luckily, her newly acquired agent, manager agent, is a runner, and he's been training with her, so that's, and he's, but she belts him up a bit, especially if it's fast. Um, he's a distance runner and he struggles with the speed, but he's, he's good though. Um, patience and consistency. You've got to have athletes and coaches <laughs> who've got to have patience. Um, <coughs> whoops, that was the wrong one. That was the, the if you like, the um, preparation, the ethical standards. Well, that's just, the athlete just knows what to do in certain situations. Um, you got to know, you know, you don't want them to suddenly get an asada, um, get tapped on the shoulder and have their asada to They've never heard anything about it and know nothing about it and they can get quite anxious about it. You need to know your event rules. Four by four, an event I've been a bit associated with, there's a few rules around four by four um, and you can, and as, as the English team did in, 90, in 2006 in Melbourne, you can stuff up uh, if you don't do the rules and the officials job is not really to, although they often do, it's not their job to tell you the rules. Um, Behaviour, you know, athletes a little bit, uh, it depends how tough they are, whether they want to, whether they think it's important or not. But I think it's, uh, it is important, especially if you want to maybe develop your, your profile and your, and your sponsorship options. If you come out as being someone that a sponsor could really get some benefits from, uh, if you're surly and don't talk to anyone, well, you're less likely for a sponsor to want to. You've got to be very, very good then. Um, loyalty, often undervalued. <laughs> Um, and patience and dedication. They've got to be dedicated if you want to be an elite athlete. Um, 
just on that, be aware of the feelings of those clubs. Be a little bit aware of what you might say might affect your people around you. Um, you're the most important, but you're not the only important person. Um, be prepared to be patient with making improvement. Don't be shy about making suggestions. I always like athletes to, because athletes know a lot. They're doing it. They know things. Um, I don't, I, if I ever did know about a decent 800, it's so far in the past, I've forgotten it. So I need them to tell me how, what it feels like. Um, an element of fun, people have talked about that. When winning, minimise the arrogance and appreciate the efforts of competitors, and we tend to be pretty good at that most of the time. When losing, try to learn from the experience. I coach a young girl who's not used to losing, and it's quite traumatic for her. Um, but she's got to get used to it because most of the time, eventually, you'll be losing to people. <laughs> um, everyone loses at times. Don't rely on others to enter you for events. I mean, it's a, it's a silly little thing, but how many people have, have known of ath young athletes, especially young athletes, who haven't got a run in because they've missed, they haven't, they either haven't entered on time and they, and they won't get a late entry, uh, or they haven't checked in in the hour before. They've turned up at half an hour and, oh, and it, I've known it many cases and we probably all have. So just, that's, the athlete's got to be a bit self-reliant in those areas. Don't think the coach is going to do it for you. The coach isn't going to enter you for the race, um, or shouldn't, um, so, and know the rules of your event. Um, they should all do their ASADA education modules. Most of the time, if you're in a, a squad, you usually have to. Um, and the performance, in-depth knowledge and understanding of physical and mental demands. Um, constructive reflection, a bit about the review and going back over things. Monitoring, a lot of things they can do themselves. A lot of, a lot of the athletes have got the apps that you can monitor, do all the monitoring you want to do. Um, desire to get it right, so that's process, technical, training, just trying to get things as right as you can get them. Sports psych, well that's an interesting area and I think um, Di's point that a lot of athletes didn't think it was that not heavily important in there. I mean, there are a lot of athletes who it's very important for, uh, with Cathy Freeman, Catherine Freeman, uh, it wasn't, because um, I don't think she may, have, she may have been interesting in a lot of ways, but I don't think getting herself up for performance was one of them. Um, strength and conditioning is very common now to have uh, separate coaches. In the old days, we used to do it all, because that was the way it was, and then we didn't really have strength and conditioning experts. Um, now there's a lot, a lot around, and um, I must admit I'm getting lazy as an old coach, so I don't really want to go to the gym much anymore. With Freeman, I went, I did her gym program, went to the gym every session she did, so it was, it was full on. <laughs> and she loved the gym, so that was, um, But these days you can often find, Katrina Bissett's got her own Melbourne Uni provided strength coach, which, and it's working really well, and we work well together. Um, recovery, they've got a really, the more elite you are, the more you've got to focus on recovery, I think. Because um, the more elite you are, the probably the harder your training may be. It's a bit of a... Um, and recovery can take a lot of ways. We all know um, the pool and the massage and various other ways. But I think, I think everything is good. And um, I'm not sure where I stand on ice baths at the moment. There's, that's become a little bit of a, a mixed... There are some that really love them and some that don't. The athletes often like them. They really think it's doing them good. Now, whether it is, is another matter, but they really think it's doing the good, and that's, and that's half the battle. If they think it's doing the good, well, it probably is. Um, but the sports scientists were all, well, they were all for them, and now there's about half and half. So I don't know where it is now. Um, so the athletes should, know, should know, it's a, know their event, help your coach do their job better, um, contribute to the program without becoming obsessive about it, and the coach is trying to second guess you all the time. Um, constructive reflection, desire to get it right, look for improvement, be optimistic and make good decisions and plan. So they need to plan and the coach needs to plan. Support team. So any moderately elite athlete should have a support team because a, a coach can't do it all. You need your coaching team initially, I will say that number one because we're all coaches here so we don't be relegated to any lower than number one. Um, it could be the primary coach, the strength coach, there could be a number of primary coaches. Um, with Annalise Ruby, I was a primary coach. Michael Dooley was a primary coach. 
Uh, the end Swiss guy was the strength coach. Um, so she had three pretty well. Um, doctor, must be a sports physician. Go along with your athlete for the sports doctor if you can. If the athlete's happy to have you there, go along, it's worth it. Um, you find out more things about it. And I must admit, my hobby in athletics is sports medicine, <laughs> for whatever reason, frustrated doctor. Need a, probably, they may or may not need a physio, or they, they will need a physio at some point. Freeman, I reckon, saw a physio about twice in 11 years. But she, but she did have, but she saw a masseur every week. <laughs> and when she was away in Europe, every day because he travelled. Um, so she would train and then be massaged. Then she, next day she'd train. So she could do a huge track training load, which I wouldn't recommend necessarily for everyone. Um, secondary, then you've got your secondary, your sports psych, your manager if you need one. A lot of athletes get a manager before they need one. Um, uh, well, you've got to have something to manage before you need a manager. Um, but if they're going to go to Europe and be a, an elite, they may... You may need an agent. If you want to run Diamond League, you need an agent. If you just want to run the Flanders Cup, well, you don't need an agent because you can do that online. Very good series of events, Flanders Cup in Belgium. Um, I think Blair, Blair is inching closer every moment. Um, that was Team Freeman at the time. That was pre-2000 Olympics. And I put Nick in there, although he, was, he dropped off the scene. But uh, he did do a fair bit of the planning. <laughs> so we left him in, This is good. Um, that was her, Sean McLaughlin, poor old Sean, he went, he'd never really run much but Susan Andrews found him in Perth and we needed one in a hurry, a training partner, so he flew to London, um, we met him, didn't know who he was but we met him anyway, found him. Uh, he trained that winter with, all the way with Freeman and about a week before the Sydney Olympics, stress fractured, she destroyed him and the poor, bloke, poor bloke never ran again. <laughs> Well, he can, he's got a few stories, though. He was on the warm-up track at the Olympic Games. <laughs> I'm big on the, like, the injury protocol, and I, I really might be towards the end, Blair, is it? <laughs> um, we didn't get on Freeman. Uh, the injury protocol. When they get injured, they've got to tell you. And they've got to, and depending on what it is, and most, most injuries, um, they've got to go and see a sports doctor as soon as they can, and it should be a sports doctor. The, the local doctor's not usually good enough, or doesn't know enough about those areas. Um, sports doctor, they can get the scan. All right, they're a bit expensive now, they're specialists, and it's, it can be a bit expensive and that sort of thing, but it might pay off in the long run. Um, the sports doctor will, will, will get a diagnosis, hopefully. Not every case, but hopefully they will, because they'll throw scans at you. Uh, and the scan hopefully will tell you you've got an injury or what it, the injury is. And then that's when the physio comes in, really. The doctor's made the diagnosis, works out a treatment plan. The physio then rehabs the athlete. Um, early diagnosis is vital. There's so many, I think the average time out for a navicular stress fracture is supposed to be something like seven months. But a lot of that is the mucking around before they get the diagnosis. They trot around and, oh, it warms up, you know, it's not bad. And they do that and then, oh, it's getting a bit worse. And now they go to the doctor after about three months. Oh, you've got a navicular stress fraction. That's, well, 12 weeks <laughs> at least, probably. Or well, certainly 12 weeks, six or seven or eight weeks in plaster or whatever. They used to do plaster all the time. They don't do plaster as much anymore, which I think is a slight problem. Um, you know, they put you in boots a lot now. But um, the only way to really unload a navicular is to put it in plaster. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's the doctors. And then you work it back. And, um, and if, you get it on, if you get onto injuries quickly, there's much more chance you'll, and there's various research that says if an athlete has a significant injury of six weeks in a preparation, in a preparation thing, they won't run any good. Now, there's exceptions to all the rules. Um, maximise the positive, minimise the negatives. And if you want to very quickly look at Freeman, Three minutes, three minutes. I'm sorry, whoever's coming after me. Um, she was a brilliant young athlete. She high jumped 153 when she was 11. Um, she ran 100 in 13.5, 26.7. I think that was a that was a record for a long time. Somebody has broken it. Um, and under 16, 15, she was able to high jump 172, and she was only 
probably 172 tall. <laughs> um, but then it, then it rapidly developed. You lovely hurdler. Four hurdles would have been anything with Freeman, but she didn't want to do them. Because um, she was a beautiful left leg lead hurdler. <laughs> that, anyone who knows the four hurdles know that's not a bad starting point. Uh, if you can run a 48 second 400 and you can hurdle really well and get a good stride pattern, you're probably going to run all right. Um, international career started off. Commonwealth Games when she was a chubby little 16 year old. Uh, but they won a gold medal, so that was really good. Made her a bit famous. Um, struggled a bit for a little while. Interestingly, 1991, she was going backwards in her 200. Um, hadn't, she was a 200 runner then. Uh, she got selected of the world champs, did not run. She wasn't considered worthy of making the six in the relay, or the four in the relay team, so she didn't run. That was shattering experience, but it probably opened the eyes. Uh, moved to Melbourne, uh, moved to Melbourne for a new start. Um, her manager partner at the time thought that Melbourne was the only place she could be a decent runner, which not true. <laughs> May have been then though, a little bit. Um, trained a bit in 92, which was six months after she came to Melbourne, she won the one, two and the four at the Vic titles and ran 52.06. And shit, you know, that's pretty good. I think she might be a 400 runner. I'd actually already decided that. Um, then she went to Perth, 51-53, qualified for the Olympic Games at 19. Um, <coughs> Melbourne GP, 23.09, so she's a quick 200 runner. Third in the, I wish I had the, wish we had the time and I still had the footage of the 1992 <coughs> national champions. I, I had a presentation once what had 92 national champions and then the Sydney Olympic race one after the other and to demonstrate the benefits of a race plan and the deficits of not having a race plan. And the 92, she, she was seven metres in front of 300 and came third. <laughs> Died unbelievably. Because she went, she thought, yeah, you run a four, you just run flat out and hang on as best you can. And it didn't work and there's some good runners, they ran 51, Lee Naylor won, uh, Sharon Russell, Sharon Stewart ran it, won it in 51, 48 or something. Um, times that the girls would be very happy to be running now, actually. Um, and then she went to London and she won the British 3A 400, and that confirmed her in the Olympic team. Didn't run that great in Barcelona. She was young and she'd been away for several months by then, so she was probably hanging on. But came back to Melbourne and uh, was decided she, she'd go to the, to the World Juniors. Um, in those days, obviously, you could qualify a little bit easier than you can now. You didn't have to run the National Juniors. Um, and she came second in the, and an interesting, an interesting athlete was sixth in that lady called Mar Marion Jones, um, who was yeah, about to give it away for a while, <laughs> for various reasons. Um, and then she went to Sydney in um, oh, 93 and it went on. Highlights after that, um, she was quite successful at the World Champs. Um, Sharon was talking a little bit about um, you know, performance excellence or you know, repeatable performance. And they were her two Olympic years, by and large. Um, and we haven't really got time to go through it, unfortunately. But in the, Olympic, in the Sydney Olympics, she ran something like eight races in nine days and was in the final, of the, well, in the last race of the 4x4 four four final, where she was getting a little tired, I think. She only, she only split for 49.3. She probably should have split a bit faster than that. Um, anyway, I think we might give it a break there. If anyone wants more, we can, we, Blair will help you out. Fantastic. Thank you very much.